This is My Geek Profile, a My Geek Culture podcast where we chat to various personalities of the Australian entertainment industry who have entertained us over the years. My name is Matt Fulton, producer, editor and host. I've been part of the media landscape for more than 15 years and I love finding out more about people who have been on television, movies, music, radio, just to see what makes them tick as well as entertain. Gavin Wood is a man of many talents. For decades, you've heard him on radio playing tunes and on television announcing tunes. He's dabbled in a bit of acting and producing TV shows and movies, but he's highly passionate about music, especially artists from the 1960s to the 1980s. Gavin Wood is especially known as the voiceover for Countdown, a music show broadcast from 1974 to 1987 on ABC TV and hosted by Ian Molly Meldrum. It was a huge success and has reached a new generation thanks to repeats for Retro Month themes on ABC's Rage. He's dabbled in a bit of silver screen acting as well, appearing in a 1980s Australian horror slash movie, Houseboat Horror, co-starring Alan Dale, Animal from Hey Hey It's Saturday, and the soundtrack created by Uncanny X-Men's Brian Mannix. He also hosted the Pop Report segment on Hey Hey It's Saturday in the 80s. With other appearances in movies and TV shows such as Mull, The Real Thing and Spicks and Specs, he's now hosting his own podcast, The Gavin Wood Countdown Podcast, showcasing artists from the countdown era and having in-depth one-on-one chats. I caught up with Gavin to find out more about his amazing career. Gavin Wood, thank you for joining. Matt, it's my pleasure. You have an extensive CV. You're a radio announcer, a TV presenter, voiceover, actor, MC. It's huge. Now, can you take me back to the earliest time in your radio career uh, and how did you get your first role? Well, I started in September 1973. I was uh, singing in some bands in Brisbane and uh, I was driving home one afternoon listening to the radio, as I did every day, and um, I was listening to 4BH, which is now, I think, um, uh, whatever the radio station, they changed so much. I've forgotten what it, what it morphed into, probably mix or something. But 4BH, uh, and there was an ad for a radio school, Ben Beckinsale's radio school. And I thought, oh, gee, that's going to help me while I'm singing songs between the songs, communicating to the audience. So I thought, oh, I'll, I'll do that. And I think it was five bucks a night, two nights a week. Uh, back then and uh, so I I did the radio course and halfway through the radio course I thought this is really good I like radio I'm starting to like this because you know I've got the gift of the gab and I don't mind having a chat so um, I did the radio course went back to my normal job which I had during the day which is a counts clerk at Thies Peabody Mitsui I was writing out checks for Euclid tyres for the coal mines you know like for one and a half million dollars and stuff like that it was good fun and then I got a call from my mother one morning. She said, oh, can you give uh, Ben Beckinsale a call? So I gave Ben Beckinsale a call at 4BH and he said, mate, there's a job going at 4MB in Maribyrnong in Queensland. I said, yeah. He said, uh, you want to make contact with the general manager? And the general manager was Frank Warwick, who read news at Channel 7 in Brisbane. And he was, uh, before he got into reading news, he was uh, in radio came from Toowoomba, then he ended up as general manager at uh, 4MB. So I rang Frank and he said, yeah, he said, can you come up? I said, I'll be on the first flight up. So the next morning I took the Fokker Friendship up to (laughs) Maribyrnong and I went into the radio station, met everybody and he said, now I just want you to go into the booth and read a couple of scripts for me. I said, yeah, sure. So I went in and read a couple of scripts and uh, came back out and I sat down and he looked at me and he said, it's film, not film. (laughs) And I went, Oh, I'm so sorry. Did I say that? He said, yes, you did. I thought, oh, no, my job's gone. I've missed it, you know. He said, when when can you start? I said, right now. He said, you've got no clothes with you. I said, I know, but I'm eager. He said, no. He said, go back home, load up your car and start next Monday. And that's that's how it happened. It was wonderful. Well, because nowadays you have to go out even further, say, regional or whatever, and have clothing on the back of you, really, or everything that you own and go from there. You just really have to keep door knocking or sending out air checks. Yeah, well, before that, Matt, what I did, um, after I finished the radio course, you get a tape, you know, of, of you know, half a dozen cold reads that you do. You get, I got a, a, a reel-to-reel tape of that. So what I did, I drove from Brisbane to Sydney 
and stopped into all the radio stations all down the East Coast. And I and met the, the manager, the program director, two and X in Newcastle. Then I went to you know, Willembar, all the way down to uh, to Sydney. And uh, no one would you know would give me a job straight away. They said, "Oh, look, you know, we'll be in touch." I said, "Good, yeah, I'm just driving out to Sydney to see some relatives." So I drove back, and and I started at 4MB, and then a week later, I got an offer to go to to Gunnedah, which is in northern New South Wales, out in the back blocks. And I, I went into Frank, and I said, "Oh, look, I've been offered a, a job in Gunnedah," and he went, "Oh, oh, that's fantastic. Are you going to take it?" I said, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, that's, that's you, you know, you've got to show some ingenuity these days because all that's changed now. You've got to, you know, you've got to, you've got to one, you've got to be persistent and two, you've got to keep knocking on their doors and, you know, being a little inventive. Yeah, that, that, that infrastructure, you know, of country radio, whether, where, you know, where the jocks go to Charleville and, you know, stay there for, uh, you know, a year, a year and a half and then they move closer in and closer in. I mean, that's not there anymore because of the central hubs and all of that. It's it's a lot more difficult for young announcers to get a job these days. Can you tell me about your transition from radio to television? Other than your extensive radio disc jockey work, you're significantly known to be the glorious voiceover and occasional presenter for the music show on the ABC called Countdown and other than the podcast, but we'll discuss that later. Uh, so how were you approached to do this role? Well, I was lucky. I I was at 4BC in Brisbane and I got offered the job at uh, 3XY in Melbourne, uh, uh, which I took straight away. And uh, I went down there and the program director who came from 4BC, Graham Smith, wonderful guy, uh, Graham said, look, uh, all the guys sound like the old 3XY final mile, how are you doing? And he said, you've come from a fantastic format where you've got to announce the records, you've got to, you know, throw to a race at Doombin, tell a few gags and throw to the newsroom and do all that. So my, my delivery was a lot different to the guys on, on the radio station. So he said, I want you to do breakfast, he said, but uh, come in and start midnight to dawn. And uh, the, the breakfast announcer looks like he's going to move back to Newcastle. His wife is putting a lot of pressure on him to move back to their hometown. So um, I, I went, yeah, sure. So I, I went in there and learnt the, uh, the desk, you know, for a couple of weeks. And then about a month into it, I got uh, put into breakfast because uh, David Jones had moved back to uh, Newcastle. And I was doing breakfast there probably for about, I don't know, a month. And Paul Turner uh, was doing nights. On 3XY, Paul Turner was the voiceover guy in Countdown. And and he walked into my studio when I was finishing at 9 o'clock one morning and he said, what are you doing when you finish knackers? And <laughs> that's the way he spoke. <laughs> and I said, uh, oh, nothing, mate. Why? He said, do you want to drive me down to Rip and Lee Studios where Countdown is? I said, because I knew Paul never had a car. I said, yeah, sure, no problems. So I still had the Volvo with the Queensland plates on them. Um, so... We drove down to, to Rip and Lee, and I was prepared to sit in the car. But he said, no, come in with me. I'll show you around. I'll show you around where Countdown's done. I thought, oh, wow, this is great. Not too many people get this opportunity. So I walked in with him. He walked into a sound booth, like a radio station, you know, into a, into a little studio, and there was a copy of the top ten on the desk. And he said to me, he said, sit down and sound like me. I said, what? He said, sit down, read out that uh, top ten, and sound like me. I went, okay. So I did it. You know, number 10 on the countdown. Da, 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 da. And then as soon as I finished, Robbie Weeks, the executive producer of Countdown, came in and said, you're the new voiceover of Countdown. You start next week and we'll pay you $60 a week. I said, well, what about Paul? He said, Paul's going to Sydney. He's leaving the show. He's going to produce the uh, prophecies of Nostradamus up in Sydney, so he won't be able to do the show, so you're the new voiceover. So I, I basically, I was in the right place at the right time, and that's how I got into television. Wow. Yeah, just brilliant. I'm, I'm, I'm thankful every day for Paul Turner. I think Paul Turner was just a wonderful guy, and he chose well. He could have chosen any other announcer on the radio station. Speaking of Countdown, so your current podcast, which is Gavin Wood's Countdown Podcast, there's a plug there for yeah. you. And yeah, thank you. <laughs> and you're able to have full in-depth chats with a lot of Australian and international musicians uh, that 
you have become friends with while on the show. You're keeping that dream alive with these discussions of a fantastic era of music. Now, without going into any legal issues, what would be the most cherished moment or event from the show that you were a part of? Um, look, they're all special in their own way. When I, you know, I, I was, I lived in LA for twelve years, and uh, I came back just before the pandemic, and uh, I said to my mate, who was the producer at uh, at Three XY back in the old days, and uh, he said, "Why don't you do a podcast?" And I said, uh, "What's a podcast?" And then he told me, and he's got a studio set up in his house because he's a producer for another radio station as well. And he said, you know, who do you think we should talk to? I said, well, really, the only people I know are the people that, you know, I grew up with on Countdown. You know, they're all mates and we've all kept in touch and it's just a phone call and I can get them. He said, well, let's do that. And and that's how how that happened. Daryl Braithwaite was our first one. He just uh, put out love songs, which is one of the greatest pop songs I've ever heard. Brilliant. Brilliant. So I rang Daryl and he said, yeah, sure, no problems. I thought, wow, that was easy. And I think that they're, at a, they're at a point in their career where, where they now really want to talk about it. You know, kind of the struggle's over for them. They've made their career. They've made their, their, they've made their position. You know, they're very happy with what they've done. And now they can talk about the struggle and how it all happened. And, and I'm a pretty inquisitive guy. And, and I, I love it because I get to ask those questions, like where were you born? How did you get your early influence? You know, were you bullied at school? And, you know, it's the only musical podcast that doesn't play music. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, because you, you're waiting for, or when I listen to it, you're just waiting for that trigger to go, all right, now this is their latest song or this is this bit, but no, it doesn't happen. It's just you, you go into your very delicate and very passionate chat with them and it just allows you allow them to open their heart. Well, yeah, why, why ruin it with a song when, you know, everybody's got 3,000 songs on their iPad, on their iPod or uh, on their iPhone or whatever and they can listen to those songs and it'll trigger them to go and buy an album hopefully. After being in LA for 12 years, I kind of know what they play over there and it would be perfect and I pleaded with Dennis Hanlon, you know, you've got to release this in America. It, it would be a worldwide hit. But I, I don't know what's happening with it, but God, it was it's such a great song. Daryl Braithwaite's really lucky because he's got these signature songs, you know, and very rarely does an artist, and we've spoken about this on the podcast, very rarely does an artist get one song that they can do, you know, but uh, like uh, Farnham will always have You're the Voice. And then secondary to that, there's a lot of, you know, there's another 80 songs underneath that he can he can go out and sing his catalogue and, and, and do a show. You know, Daryl Braithwaite, you know, he's got uh, How's That? And then he goes into uh, As the Days Go By and then Horses and now Love Songs. You know, he's got all these great songs and that's what it's all about, getting those, getting those songs that you can get a career off. Well, speaking of other musicians and other artists, uh, you also ended up hosting a regular weekly segment on called The Pop Report on Hey Hey Saturday in the mid-80s. Now, the, yes. sh- the shenanigans, are you okay to talk about this? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, had a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun doing that. It was terrifying but funny at the same time. Well, uh, because of the episodes being up on heyhey.tv and I paid a subscription and watched a few episodes, now the, the shenanigans that went on during that show and – Basically, Crystal and John Blackburn just wreaking sabotage on, on your segment with all the yeah. pranks and props. How on earth yeah. did you ignore it all and just push through with your show? Well, see, I, I would get record reps coming around to my house during the week saying, you know, this is the record that we want to push, have a listen to it, and we'd, we'd have a little record party and we'd l- listen to the songs. And I'd say, oh, yeah, that's a good one. Well, that, that'll go on the show and then that one will go on the show. And, you know, so I'd walk in with, with about five big white boards with, with cue cards with all the information that I wanted in the pop report. I'd do a lot of research into it. So I'd have to go through it because I had a commitment to the record company that I would, one, play the song or play the video or talk about the song or whatever. So they'd wait till I was probably halfway through. So I always made sure that I put all the important stuff in the first half. And then after that, after that, they can go crazy. (laughs) So so 
I knew something was going to happen every time I walked on the set. It was wonderful. Well, there was one episode which I I think it might have been from 1984 where because I occasionally I just go random and just pick a, an episode and then see what comes up. Yeah. And that's one brilliant thing about the show is that you can just pick it up at any time. It's a bu- brilliant time capsule. There's one where you're as you're presenting your report, they had the forklift and next thing you know, you're being raised to the roof. Oh, yeah, and then they shook it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. The, 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 big, the raising, going up was fine, but when they started to shake the uh, the desk and the seat that I was on, I thought any moment this is going to fall off the forklift oh. and and crash to the floor. That that was my only concern. Hey, there was no such thing as OH&S back in the day, was there? Oh, no, they would have shut the show down straight away. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. Can't get away with that these days. <laughs> oh, no. Oh. oh, no. But what what brilliant stuff. I mean, that's, it's it's kind of golden golden television when you think about it, you know, all the stuff you could get away with. And then all of a sudden, you know, you, you can't tell a joke anymore. That's why Daryl came up with the island of Bidalonia yep. because he wasn't allowed to tell Irish jokes anymore. Or Polish jokes, you weren't allowad to tell those, you know, and everybody oh. started everybody started getting serious. So he came up with the idea of uh, Bitalonia so he could tell the joke. That's very clever. I didn't really think about that. Well, there you go. You've learned something today, Matt. Fantastic. That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to dive back into uh, your other side of your career, which is you've, you're a bit of a part-time actor. And you've popped up on various TV shows other, um, other than yourself, uh, but you've been in movies like Mull and The Real Thing. One that I really love the most is the Aussie cult classic Houseboat Horror. Now, that is where the whole concept is where a houseboat is rented by a rock band and production crew in order to film a music clip and yep. only to be terrorised by a really crazed murderer. And, and mm-hmm. then you find out who it is later on in the movie. Uh, but you play a character called Costello. and Jimmy Costello, yeah. which was always the name. If I ever went bust in radio and creditors were trying to find me, I'd, get, I'd, I'd go over to Perth and, uh, and get a job on radio there and my name would be Jimmy Costello. <laughs> that, was, that, that was my alter ego. Oh, wow. That was a lot of fun. I mean, that, that movie... Uh, I mean, people are still talking about it. It's like Countdown, you know. It's it's it, it was done with, you know, the best intentions, and it was done with heart. But that movie uh, was done for ten thousand dollars. Wow. Uh, yeah, we got ten thousand dollars out of the underground disco, uh, <laughs> and 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 uh, it paid for uh, some some of the crew. Uh, I did it for nothing. Uh, a lot of people did it for nothing. They they ran out of money for catering. Um, so one day we got lettuce sandwiches for lunch. Oh, wow. And that's when we realised that things aren't going too well here. Um, the director, uh, Kendall Flanagan, had a heart attack uh, halfway through and couldn't continue on, so so Ollie Martin had to carry on and be, be the director. Oh, it was just – it was a mess. The, uh, the film crew and the television crew, uh, it was kind of half-half. And the film crew hated the television crew because the television crew were all falling down drunk, and and the film crew were very professional. Uh, so there, <laughs> there was a lot of that. There was just a lot of booze, and and uh, I think we worked for booze for two weeks up at Eildon. You know, it was it was look, we I, we'd never made a movie before, and I think you know just the the idea of making a movie was very romantic, and. And we did it, God damn it! You know, albeit that bad, but we did it. <laughs> the line that you're really known for in that movie was saying, "The view's magnificent, you'll bar up." Now, yeah, yeah. was that an improv line or was that in the script? Yeah. No, it wasn't in the script. They just they just said, "Get up there and and be excited about the view." And I went, "Oh God, okay." I said, "Hey, fellas, girls, guys, come up here! It's magnificent. The views the views magnificent. You'll bar up." <laughs> <laughs> and then they went, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> that is One amazing. Time. Thank you, thank you. And isn't it funny, just a simple little thing like that, you know, it stands out and, and remains part of the uh, part of the culture. I, I, I think it's magnificent that uh, this uh, $10,000 movie is still getting people talking about it. It's, it's quite amazing. There was a loose script. They kind of knew what they wanted. It's, it's like when you go on air, you got to know – how to start in you know as soon as you turn on the mic you got to know what you're going to say at the beginning know what you're going to say in the middle 
and know how to finish it. And I, and I think that was the idea that Greg Petherick and, and Ollie Martin had. They they wanted a horror movie done up at Eildon, monster with a big machete, slopping, slashing heads and everything like that in this houseboat with a rock band. And I think that's as far as they went. A few years ago, I think it was the first APR Tom Alive tour, and Brian Mannix uh, was in town, and so we did a presentation yeah, with him. Yeah, and I showed him. Yeah. I, I tracked down the copy of Housebat on DVD and showed it to him, and he just laughed his head off. And he goes, "Mate, this is a pure piece of shit. I love the fact that it is shit." <laughs> yeah, yeah, and on the front it's got with snappy Brian Mannix hits or something, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> knockout Brian just Mannix hits, and he just knock rolled out, his knock eyes. Knockout Brian Mannix hits. That's right, because he wrote all the music. Yeah. <laughs> He goes, there was a lot of fun times, not necessarily in the movie, just a lot of fun times during that movie. It so. basically was. It was just uh, controlled chaos and, um, and as I said before, a lot of VB. In 1992, The Late Show highlighted bits and pieces with a segment called Countdown Classics. Now, did you manage to catch a glimpse of it when it was on TV? I know that Tony Martin uh, liked like some countdown. Tony Martin got into Housebreak Horror as well. God love him. And I, I loved I loved all those guys. They were so funny. And Jane Kennedy, that was such a great mix of people. Thanks to the rescuing of the tapes by w- – were you actually part of it? Uh, to Were you helping Molly save the tapes or of Countdown? Well, it was actually Ted Emery, one of the producers. Ted Emery went on to uh, produce – uh, the uh, you know Tom Gleisner and Jane Kennedy and and all those people in in their first television roles, um, but Ted Emery uh, saw what they were doing and they were wanting to get all these tapes because the ABC didn't have any budget to buy new tapes, so they were, they were going back into the archive, taking out these tapes and re-recording over them. So uh, Ted. God love him, uh, put a whole stack of countdowns in the boot of his car and, um, and drove around like that for quite a few months until the, uh, until the, the plunging was over. Oh, wow. And the pillaging was over, yes. So he, he saved a, a lot of copies of Countdown. When Rage Free plays the episodes of Countdown uh, every January, do you, have you tuned into an episode or two or do you – get people asking, oh, you know, this episode, blah, 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 that, and it was on that night, but you weren't aware of it. Have they? Have you been called out by anyone in regards to a recently played repeat? Uh, no, not really. I used to know when the repeats were on because all of a sudden my social media would, would activate and I'd get more friend requests <laughs> of course. Uh, when I was in LA. You know, all of a sudden overnight, you know, there'd be 20 friend requests and I'd go, Oh, it must be February. It must be January. And then I'd uh, get on onto the ABC site, and then I'd realise that they played a countdown the night before. So, uh, yeah, that that was the only indication. Uh, and since I've been back, I've seen a couple of them um, that that they play on another ABC channel, and uh, they play classic countdown and and all of that. So, look, it, it it's great and. I spoke to Grant Rule, who was the executive producer in the last, you know, eight years of Countdown, and Grant went on to make some big television shows and commercial television, and uh, and he, you know, we both agree that Countdown is a show that just keeps on giving, because it was done without any agenda. We we went in there with with clean hearts and minds, no egos. All we wanted to do was elevate Australian music to the level of international music. And we wanted to get all our bands up to a level by giving them by giving them a stage and giving them a workplace so that they can work on their craft. And that's basically all we wanted to do. And so there was no agendas. We didn't we didn't uh, take the show for granted or anything like that. Molly and I just went in and and had a great time and 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 worked as hard as we could. What are your thoughts on with the repeats of Countdown and also the specials that you have done recently of Classic Countdown, which were absolutely amazing? Now, what what are your thoughts on these shows able to reach a new generation appreciating the, that music genre of the seventies and eighties? Oh, look, I, I think it's I think it's important uh, to uh, to tell the new, and it's all about generations. That's the reason why Countdown stopped. You know, a generation went through that loved Countdown. A uh, generation with their m- mothers and fathers every Sunday night, they'd sit and watch the show. Um, 
And then when the when the, those brothers and sisters grew up and the younger brothers and sisters came up behind them, well, they were into something else. They went into Countdown. So naturally, you know, the three million people that watched every Sunday night started to fall off at the end because it had come to the end of its generation. But it's it, it's great to to be nostalgic because it was a, a simpler time uh, uh, and um, and it was great television as far as I'm concerned. We we did some great shows and 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 there were some some clips that we did that were better than the film clips that they paid for. You know, so so because of that and because it went all around Australia on te- ABC television, that was the impact of the show. So I think because of that, people now are nostalgic. Uh, but I don't think it's that's big enough for a similar countdown to come on because there's too many distractions like that, like, like what happened when the demise of countdown, you know, computers came in, video games came in and all of a sudden there was lots of distractions and people forgot about that, that uh, six o'clock showing on a Sunday night. The TV series, the channel seven series, which was based on Molly Meldrum's life. How yes. did you feel about comedian, and actor Ed Cavalli playing you in the show. Oh, I was wrapped. Have you seen Ed Cavalli? He's a good-looking guy, and he's a nice guy. I've spoken to him when he was at Triple M in Brisbane, and we spoke about that. I was, mate. I was when I found out that Ed Cavalli was playing me. I said, "Oh, I don't have to watch the show. This will be brilliant. I'm happy." <laughs> <laughs> When well, a good-looking dude plays you, you get very happy about it. With the Countdown Arena Spectacular that was held a couple of years ago, the two concerts, how much of that were you a part of? Well, you say a couple of years ago. That was like 14 years ago. Do uh, you realise that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I didn't want to <laughs> actually say the year. So. Yeah, yep. it was a while ago now. I, well, look, I, I, um, I was employed, obviously, by Michael Godinski, who was the uh, – promoter and and basically the uh, instigator of putting those three tours together around Australia. And he got me to do the voiceovers and uh, I did the intro to the show at the beginning and just did the voiceovers. But I was just so happy that all those artists can have, you know, another another go at being in front of a huge stadium audience. And and they loved it too. And and also with the internationals like Katrina from Katrina and the Waves, she came out. And David Payton from Pilot, you know, that he he had the easiest job. He came from Scotland to be on the show. And he would go out and go, Oh ho ho, it's magic. And then all of a sudden the whole crowd just took the show, took the song. And so, and he just sat back and let the, the crowd sing that song. Then his next song was January, and then everybody sang the song. And he got <laughs> off stage one, got off stage one night, and I said, "You're the laziest person in 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 music in the world right now." He said, "Oh, why?" I said, "You don't have to do a bloody thing." He said, "Yeah, they're good songs, aren't they?" <laughs> <laughs> That's and all he's need. made. He's made millions out of those two songs with uh, backing for insurance companies. Uh, uh, all these other big corporate companies in America. I used to hear magic, oh, ho, ho, it's magic, behind cosmetic commercials, everything, all through this, all on, on American television. He's made a fortune. And good luck to him. He's a nice guy. Other than your very successful Countdown podcast, what current yeah. or future projects are you working on that you can reveal? Uh, well, we've just signed uh, with, the, with the ARN network. Uh, which is Gold and WS and KQ in Brisbane and a couple of stations in Adelaide and one in Perth uh, to do um, a countdown show. Oh wow! For ten, for ten weeks uh, at the on, hopefully uh, it'll be in the same time slot as Countdown every Sunday night at six pm for ten weeks, and it's using parts of parts of our podcast and uh, playing some of the songs. Uh, which is probably exactly what people want, and they'll get it in this ten-part series of uh, Gavin Woods Countdown uh, on the ARN network. Oh, I got to tune in for that. That sounds amazing. Now, if you could go back in time and relive any moment in your life, what part of that timeline would you jump back to? Gee, Matt, that's a great question. Great question to ask someone. I think I might steal that for my podcast. <laughs> You're more than welcome to. <laughs> That's a very good question. Um, I don't really want to go back. I, I'd love to go back 
I grew up in Roma in Western Queensland as a young boy from, from uh, zero to 14. And I love that time of innocence growing up in a country town. Love that a lot, but I wouldn't want to necessarily go back. Um, you know, I've done everything and I always, I'm always optimistic and positive and, and I've been taught in radio to always lean forward and anticipate what's coming. And I just, I just believe in the now and what's, what's happening right now and what could happen in the next few days or weeks. Um, it's great to look back fondly nice times but don't spend too much time back there enjoy it for what it is but you know you've got a life to live and you've only got one life in this body that you have that you carry through this life and enjoy every moment i find now now that i'm you know getting older that i'm becoming like a camera i'm taking i'm taking screenshots of you know where i go and what i do and what restaurants I'm in and who I'm with and all of that, because back in the eighties, man, it was a blur. You know, we were going from one disco, Molly and I were flying all over the country doing discos um, and, and we'd be doing a, a blue light disco here and then one in Cairns and then, then Molly was doing one in Perth and, and it was just crazy. And you just don't stop to uh, smell the roses. And I think it's very important that you've got to take in what life, life, what life is and what's happening around you and enjoy the moment. Gavin Wood, thank you so much for your time. As a fan, this conversation means so much. Well, Matt, it was my pleasure, mate. Any time for you. You can download Gavin Wood's Countdown Podcast on your favourite podcast platform. Thanks for listening to My Geek Profile Podcast for mygeekculture.com.au. This podcast is produced by Matt Fulton Productions, mattfulton.com.au.